Good morning. God bless you. It's wonderful to see you all. And uh, it was very difficult to pull ourselves away from Durban. Uh, it was great just to have the time of, just to go away and just breathe. Uh, and of course, we come back to Matthew 24. Now, how many of you received the email that I sent out a few days ago? How many of you did not receive the email? How many of you have not opened your email? All right, because you should have all received it if you're on the mailing list. I think you all are. I just want to chat about a few things today. Uh, as you've seen, a lot of folks aren't here today, a number of people, uh, because of the uh, COVID-19, they've just chosen rather to remain at home and not to uh, risk exposure. We live in a very interesting times, and I think before, you know, we, we, we kind of get into praise and worship, which is why we came here today in the first place. Uh, it's just, let's just deal with what's going on in the world. And, and I want to just touch on some of the things that I, I spoke about in the, in the email itself, is that we find ourselves living at a time where the predictions of Jesus regarding events that must take place prior to his return are becoming more and more frequent. And what we're seeing around us, not just, you know, with the coronavirus, and it's just interesting to note, to, to, uh, note on that point, is that while the coronavirus has, has probably over the last, it's been, I guess, in the public space for the last five to six weeks, there's been unprecedentedly large swarms of locusts on a biblical proportion destroying crops and vegetation in Tanzania, in Kenya, in Ethiopia. But none of this is making the news because it doesn't affect the economies of Western nations and uh, your G20 nations. So because it's Africa and everybody cares about Africa, it's not mentioned. Yet Jesus, he foretold that there was going to be a an increase in earthquakes, uh, and he uses the word pestilence. And that word pestilence is really interesting in Matthew 24, because it, it's the Greek word uh, lome, and it, it means, it's very meaning, it, it is uh, literally a plague. Both a plague of disease and of pests. So that what, we, what we read about in the book of Exodus, where God sent plagues on Egypt. He sent both disease, physical illness, and pests in the forms of frogs and mites and, uh, and things like that. So it was both the disease as well as using creatures to bring great discomfort and destruction. So as we go and, and, and look at what Jesus said, and I don't, I don't want to do a whole eschatology teaching, and I'm sure you don't want to hear it either. But he, he, he tells us that there's going to, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. And this is, the reality is that there are numerous wars being fought all over the world. In, in Southern America, in Africa, in the Middle East, uh, parts of Asia, there are wars being fought, mainly civil wars, with the exception perhaps of the Middle East, where many nations are being involved. He said there are wars, and there are rumors of wars. Everyone's worrying about whether Russia and America are going to face off in the Middle East. And Jesus said that kingdom, or nation will rise against nation. Well, let me, sorry, let me, let me backtrack. He says, see that you're not troubled. You hear wars and rumors of wars and see that you're not troubled. Don't let these things trouble you. He then goes on to say, for well, all these things must come to pass. But then it's not yet. He goes on to say, for well, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilence, which is, a, as I said, both disease and destruction brought about by the creatures of God's creation. And earthquakes in various places, all these are the beginning of sorrows. This is not the, it's not the seven year of tribulation. This is the beginning of sorrows. This is what must transpire that will lead up to the tribulation period. Then he says, 
They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. There's going to come a dramatic uh, I don't use a dramatic change in people's attitude towards Christians. A dramatic change. Already, I, was, uh, I listened briefly to something on the radio a few days ago, and the radio host was mocking Christians. Now, unfortunately, most of the mockeries because of the way Christians behave themselves, especially pastors. But we are going to see an increase in persecution. So Jesus says they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. All these things we're seeing, we're seeing people who we once loved, who we once walked with, turn against us. Not just against myself, but turn against you. Christians that you've known. And they're becoming offended. Why are they becoming offended? They're becoming, becoming offended because the Lord is pointing out areas in their lives that they need to bring before Him in repentance. Now, none of us like to be exposed. None of us like to face the reality of who we are. And so, we either repent and ask God to forgive us, or else we harden our hearts. And what's happening is a lot of believers are hardening their hearts. And they're becoming offended. They're becoming offended with people who have loved them, people who have cared for them, who have walked with them, who have befriended them. All these signs, Jesus said, would accompany his soon return. How do we as Christians then navigate these waters? We are called to obey the law of the land. So long as that law doesn't usurp the word of God. So when the South African government said that we cannot meet in groups of more than a hundred, it was not a wicked law. It's a very there's a lot of wisdom. Everything that the government has done thus far is wise. And we as Christians need to walk both in obedience to God, obedience to the authority that God has put into our land, to the degree that they do not transgress the word of God. It might come to pass that they, the government will reduce that number. What happens if we can only meet in the 50s? Or what happens when we get to Europe where basically we are isolated? We need to Consider how we're going to deal with that. So it might be that we're going to have to break up from the home churches. Or it might be that we're just going to have to meet a few people in the house. You see, we're, not, we're called not to forsake the gathering of the saints. But the gathering of the saints, you know, it, it's relative. Because if two or more are gathered in his name, he's there. That's the gathering of the saints. So whether it's families spend time together with the Lord, or two families come together, that's still the gathering of the saints. And I think we must use wisdom in this so that we do not bring a reproach to Christ. When they say you can no longer preach Jesus, when, they're not, when they say you can no longer speak in the name of Jesus, that's different. But I think we need to be very wise. What are your thoughts? Right, so we will obey the law of the land. There are just two other things I want to touch on. Historically, God in Scripture has kept those who are His. And in my email, I, I look at the account of the Jews in Egypt. Now, God kept them with the plagues. But the reality is that uh, nearly 100 years ago, in fact, 800 years ago, the world saw the greatest lethal disease that has been recorded in human history. It was called the Spanish Flu, where estimates of up to 70 million people died between 1918 and 1920. In this country alone, South Africa, 360,000 people lost their lives due to the Spanish Flu. Now remember, back in 1920, this was a very sparsely populated country with people mainly living in rural areas. 
very few living in the urban city centers. So 360,000 was a large number. However, there were Christian missionaries that were ministering at that time. And one of them was a guy by the name of Reese Howell. I don't know if anybody's heard of Reese Howell. He was, him and his wife had a mission station, and not one person on their mission station caught the Spanish flu. In fact, a local village nearby was struck by the flu, and the chief came to Reese Howe and said, can you, help, can you help us? And he said, you bring your people, because our God is able to do what your ancestors can't do. And every single person in that village came to the mission station. Those that were sick were all healed, and not one perished. But there were other believers in other places who loved the Lord, served the Lord, who died because of it. We cannot, and I think this is so important, we can trust God for healing, we can trust God for protection, but we cannot be presumptuous. All right, I think it's very, and I think a lot of people are going to have their faith severely tested in this, especially those people who hold the word of faith doctrine, where they demand healing, and they expect that healing is their God-given right. <clears throat> Salvation is the covenant. Healing is a grace. We can trust God for our salvation, but healing is a grace. We, we agree with that. Because we see it through Scripture, where men of God, who have been faithful to God, remain sick. Is it wrong to profane? It's wrong to make a declaration that God has not spoken Himself. So what we can say is that we can, you know, obviously Psalm 91 comes to mind, where the Bible says, no plague shall come near you near your dwelling. And we can trust the Lord for these things. But to say emphatically, God will not allow me to get sick. That's presumption. What we can say is, I trust that the Lord will keep me in His will. Remember, we're under a new covenant. It's, there's a difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant, you could trust God for complete protection. You could trust God that your enemies would come into the land. You could trust God that your your crops would not be harmed. But Jesus said that we ought to have treasure in heaven, where thief does not break into steel. He didn't say, lay tre yourself treasures in heaven, don't worry about the thief, because you're protected. He said to believers, where thief breaks in to steal. So that's contrary to the covenant of the Old Testament. And Jeremiah himself said in Jeremiah 31, he's, he prophesied that God would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Jacob, not according to the covenant he made with their fathers. So we are not under the Mosaic covenant. We're under a different covenant because our covenant, which is going to lead into the message that should we get there today, is that we have been given a covenant that we will enter the kingdom of heaven. Israel had a covenant that they would live peacefully in the land. Our covenant is a greater covenant with greater promises, but it's a covenant that isn't limited to a geographical area. Our covenant extends to the kingdom of heaven and into eternity. It is a greater covenant. It is a covenant that has us been prepared to rule and reign with Jesus Christ, to judge not only angels, but to stand in judgment of men in the millennium. And so our character is foremost on God's agenda. Our faith and our being conformed and transformed to the image of Jesus is God's priority. Way above our comfort and our physical health. Yet we can trust God for healing as a grace, but we cannot be dogmatic. And I have, there's a series I've, I, I, I have taught in the past on, on healing. Will we cover this? Are we all okay? 
And then finally, as we look around, we notice that we are brethren and sisters that aren't here. And there are those who aren't here because they have other commitments, and there are those who are, here because, are not here because they have a real concern of contracting the virus. How do we deal with that? This is so important. We, we understand how do we, how do we relate to one another where we all have very different levels of faith. And I want to read for you uh, Romans chapter 14. Now the context, of course, is keeping to the Mosaic law. The context of Romans 14 is can a Jewish, can a Jewish believe and I eat a pork pie? Can he feel comfortable worshiping on a Sunday? This is, this is really the background of the book of Romans and specifically Romans 14 where you had a mixed congregation of Jews and Gentiles and the Gentiles are now walking in the liberty that has been brought in Jesus Christ. They can eat whatever they like. They can wear whatever they like. They aren't concerned about the, the laws of Moses. Uh, they deal with food, drink, and what you, what you wear. And so Paul says in chapter 1, or verse, four, sorry, verse 1, chapter 14, he says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes of doubtful things. For one who believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. That's the vegans. <laughs> let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Now, obviously, we need to take the truth of what Paul is saying and apply it to this context that, that we ourselves are facing. If some people believe that they can't go out because they're going to expose themselves to the virus, another person can may feel, well, you know, I have trust in the Lord. I have, I have a sense that I'll be okay. And let not him who says, I feel I'll be okay when I go out, condemn or criticize or judge him who feels that he can't. It's, it's the same principle. It's, it's, it's a different uh, situation, but the same principle. Verse 5, one person esteems one day above another, okay, blah, 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 blah. Um, then he goes to say in um, verse, let's take down verse 14, he says, I know, he says, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in itself. Uh, take that from verse 19. Sorry, therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace, and the things by which one may edify another. Let us pursue the things that make for peace and may encourage one another. Saying to somebody you've got, you got no faith is not edifying and not encouraging. Would you agree? Yes. If I have a real concern about contracting the, the, the virus or sickness and somebody comes up and says, you've got no faith, I don't feel that encouraged in Jesus. Says, verse 20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of coronavirus. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of wars and rumors of wars. Do not forsake the work of God. We're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Not how we're going to stand in trials. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? And this is where it's important to us. Do you have faith? Have you got faith? Have you got faith to come out here? Well, obviously you do. You have faith that God is going to keep you. So you have faith. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Then I must let your faith between that which is between you and God. Our faith is not something we wear as a badge. Our faith is not something that we use to lord over people. Having faith is not something we boast of. Our faith is between us and the Lord. And never think you've got great faith. Because God will put you into a situation where your real faith is exposed. And you'll realize you don't have as much faith as you thought you had. Your faith, great, have it between you and God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. 
But he who drowns is condemned. He eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not of faith is sin. So when we force somebody to do something that is outside their faith comfort zone, we cause them to sin. So don't get on the phone and I'll say, listen, brother, I noticed you were in the church. What's wrong with your faith? <laughs> and you embolden them to do something that they don't have faith for, you then are causing them to sin. All right, so let's just be conscious of that. We love one another, we edify one another, we encourage one another. As a church, we're going to abide by the law of the land, so long as it doesn't transgress the will of God. Our meeting together will be restricted to what the government uh, desires. And if we have to go the home church route, we'll go the home church route gladly. If it comes to the point where we need to just meet a few families together, we'll do that as well. All right, so now the question is the Passover. And you guys, you've, you've done your booking, you've done your reservations, you've paid for it. Nobody likes to be done out of cash. So the, the Passover is what, about three weeks away? Or two and a half weeks away? Uh, this, uh, you know, we're really in the early stages of the, of the virus being this country. And if any of the uh, statistics that we've seen in Europe and in China, and the Middle East, if any of those, if that's, if those are statistics that we can rely on in the next three weeks, uh, they're, they're going to be probably tens of thousands of people infected in this country. Uh, in fact, the chances are probably that that might happen. In which case, I doubt that we'll be able to do it. So there's one or two things we can do. We can either postpone it. <laughs> or else uh, you can get a refund by not giving by not giving what you what you gave for the next month or two. You, all right, we're not giving you your money back. Now, Kim, can I give your money back? Just uh, just ask us for a refund in triplicate. Get signed by heaven, and we'll uh, just again just joking. Let's just play by here and, and see what transpires, but I think there's probably a very good chance that we might have to cancel it and we'll postpone it. All right, that's my story before we get into worshiping the Lord. Anybody want to ask a question, make a comment, anything that is, will edify us, us, us.